ADC RV2 has been taking over as the most common steel for beginner bladesmiths due to its good availability and low cost. It has even been taking over from the old standby 1084 steel. How does it compare to 1084? What are the differences that bladesmiths need to watch out for? I have also seen a wide range of recommendations for heat treating ADC RV2. Why the different recommendations and what is best? I've got answers to all these questions and more, so keep watching. First, an introduction to ADC RV2. No steel is best at everything. Every steel has its pros and cons. There's no such thing as a boring steel. Except for ADC RV2, which is incredibly dull. <laughs> but, but don't beat yourself up too much about it. Most steels used by forging bladesmiths are pretty boring. I'm gonna make it exciting. Maybe. So first, a, a couple words about carbon content. The 80 in ADC RV2 means that it has roughly the same carbon content as 1080 and 1084 steels with 0.80% carbon. This is helpful for ensuring that you don't get too much carbon in solution, which reduces toughness. As you get over 0.6% carbon in solution, that increases in hardness with further carbon, but it's very small. Uh, while the toughness goes down rapidly with increasing plate martensite. I've seen this especially in 1% carbon steels like 01 and 1095, where they have greatly reduced toughness without modified heat treatments to reduce plate martensite like mar quenching, os tempering, or reduced osinatizing temperatures. You can see that in this chart for 01, where osinatizing at 1425 led to improved toughness when compared with standard temperature of 1475, and even more so when compared with 1550. Os tempering is a heat treatment to form bainite instead of martensite, so with no plate martensite, the toughness is even greater. I have a couple articles that cover this in more detail that I will link in the description. On the other hand, those higher carbon steels have more carbide in them for increased wear resistance. ADC RV2 also has a small vanadium addition which helps suppress grain growth. Steel wants its grains to grow, and the higher the temperature of the steel, the more rapidly this can occur. With a vanadium addition to a low alloy steel, there's an array of small vanadium carbides that pin grain boundaries and greatly reduces grain growth. This is helpful with high forging temperatures and reduces the risk of overheating during the final heat treatment. The other major difference between ADC RV2 and 1080 and 1084 is that manganese has been reduced and replaced with chromium. Chromium also contributes to hardenability like manganese does. Hardenability is a measure of how slowly you can quench and still achieve maximum hardness without undesirable transformations happening instead. However, chromium creates differences in other areas of heat treating that we will get into later. Okay, let's compare the final properties of ADC RV2 against other knife steels. The wear resistance of ADC RV2 is quite low due to its lack of carbide in the heat treated microstructure. It gets virtually all of its wear resistance from the hardness that it is heat treated to instead. The low wear resistance means that grinding and finishing is very easy. However, the edge retention from abrasive wear is very low like other low alloy steels with little or no carbide. Fortunately, the steel can be heat treated to a relatively wide range of hardness, so knives can be heat treated to 62 Rockwell C or higher to help with edge retention in thin slicing knives. The toughness of ADC RV2 is quite good though. The lack of plate martensite in combination with low carbide volume means its toughness is excellent, and with correct heat treating it maintains good toughness up to relatively high hardness. The toughness of ADC RV2 is only outclassed by steels like 8670 and 5160 when it comes to the low alloy steel group. Oh, hello. I was just looking in my book, Knife Engineering, for my recommended temperatures on heat treating ADC RV2. It's an excellent reference for all of the things that I forget all the time. You might find it to be a good reference too. There's a huge range of different heat treatments that are used by bladesmiths for steels like ADC RV2. It can be incredibly confusing because many of the heat treatments seem to contradict each other. And some of them are overly complicated and have too many steps. I think they might be trying to make up for using boring steel by overcomplicating the heat treatment. So first I'm going to give you a brief overview of the entire process so you can follow along more easily when I'm getting into the details for each step. For forging bladesmiths, the first step is forging, of course. There isn't much to say here other than don't forge the steel too hot. A general temperature maximum for forging low alloy steels is 2100 degrees Fahrenheit or 1150 Celsius, though some data sheets recommend lower such as 1925 degrees Fahrenheit or 1050 Celsius. Lower temperatures mean that decarburization and grain growth is minimized, but also means a narrower temperature range to forge in. 
After forging, you perform your heat treating steps to get the steel ready for drilling, cutting, grinding, and the final steps of hardening, including austenitizing, quenching, and tempering. This group of steps is sometimes generically referred to as thermal cycling, which I have a separate video about where I talk more in depth on the goals of each step and what is happening in the steel during each one. Uh, my preferred method is to perform a normalize and anneal, though there are quite a few methods out there. I will compare with another common method in just a minute. The steel also comes annealed from the steel supplier, so this is the point at which all steps are performed by both bladesmiths and stock removal knife makers. The steel is then austenitized, quenched in oil to achieve a high hardness martensite microstructure, and then tempered to improve toughness at the expense of a bit of hardness. So let's back up to the normalization process. After forging, the steel has a large grain size and can often have an inconsistent microstructure with varying carbide sizes and potentially undesirable carbides along the grain boundaries. So our goal with normalizing is to have a smaller, consistent grain size and a consistent carbide structure. The easiest way to do this is to reheat the steel to a point where all of the carbide has been dissolved. And then when we air cool, a structure called perlite is formed, which is alternating bands of carbide and ferrite. Therefore, it is important that the steel is heated to a high enough temperature to dissolve everything. Some knife makers get ahead of themselves trying to use very low temperatures because they want to start achieving the finest possible grain size before they have taken care of undesirable carbides from forging. For ADCRV2, I recommend at least 1550 degrees Fahrenheit, though up to 1650 is perfectly fine. Heat for 10 to 30 minutes and air cool, at least until the steel is fully magnetic again, which is the point at which the transformation is complete. If you don't have a furnace, then heat to at least 1600 to make up for the fact that you aren't holding at the temperature. The temperature doesn't need to be super precise, so checking the temperature with a method like a temple stick or a laser thermometer is fine. Though in general, I haven't had good luck with cheap laser thermometers. You can add in a lower temperature grain refining step after normalizing by reheating to a lower temperature and air cooling. But in tests of 1084, I did not find a difference in fracture grain or toughness as long as the steel was properly annealed after normalizing. So until I find a case where extra grain refining steps led to an improvement, I recommend doing a simple normalize and anneal. The possible exception is for forge heat treatments where I don't recommend an anneal, but I will get into that later. Perlite is usually pretty soft, but a structure of round or spheroidized carbides machines better and responds differently to heat treatment. You have more control over how much carbide is dissolved during austenitizing from a spheroidized structure. And it heat treats more similarly to steel as it comes from the factory. So if you are mixing stock removal and forge knives, you don't need to change austenitizing temperatures to compensate for a different starting microstructure. To anneal, you heat to a low temperature where the steel has transformed to non-magnetic austenite, but lower than a typical hardening temperature. You want there to be carbide left in the structure prior to slow cooling. This low austenitizing temperature also acts as a grain refining step of sorts, as we are essentially using the lowest temperature we can get away with while also making the steel non-magnetic after transforming to austenite. For ADCRV2, I recommend 30 minutes at 1400 degrees Fahrenheit for this step. A typical data sheet recommendation says to slow cool at 50 degrees Fahrenheit per hour or even slower to get the final spheroidized structure. However, significantly faster is possible while also getting a spheroidized structure, and I recommend 600 degrees Fahrenheit per hour instead. This will result in finer carbides versus the slower cooling, leading to faster heat treating response and sometimes improved toughness. You can also achieve roughly the same thing by heating the steel to non-magnetic and no hotter, and then placing the steel in a slow cool media like vermiculite. There are several alternative ways to anneal. One is called a subcritical anneal. Subcritical refers to being heated below the critical temperature or below where the steel transforms to austenite and becomes non-magnetic. Perlite will spontaneously spheroidize if given enough time at a temperature sufficient for carbon to move around. The problem with subcritical annealing is that it takes a very long time, even hundreds of hours. The New Jersey Steel Baron data sheet says to use 1350 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 minutes as the final step of thermal cycling, and that simply isn't enough time to do much of anything. So the microstructure you get at the end is perlite. If you want perlite, that is one thing, but if so, this 1350 degree step can be eliminated as it makes no difference. But before we get to the final and most important heat treating steps, I want to remind you to subscribe to the Knife Steel Nerds YouTube channel. Just imagine if I were to have another video about a topic just as exciting as ADCR V2 and you missed out on it. I could talk about cutting edge steels like 1095 or surgical stainless or who knows. You wouldn't want that to happen, would you? Would, would you? Of course not, Biff. Now I wouldn't want that to happen. 
So with these differences in microstructure going into the final hardening steps, I decided to do a comparison in how each responds to heat treatment. I have several different prior microstructures to compare. One is the condition supplied from the manufacturer. I have steel from Alpha Knife Supply, Jantz, and New Jersey Steel Baron. The New Jersey Steel Baron ADC RV2 is from Buderis, while the other two suppliers don't publicize the manufacturer. The Jantz and Alpha Knife Supply material were somewhat finer than the Buderis material as received. This will be important in terms of the heat treatment response, as you will see in the results of these experiments later on. I then have steel that I processed to simulate thermal cycling done by a bladesmith. I used the Jantz material for these experiments. I heat treated the steel to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit for an hour to simulate forging. With one set, I heated to a normalizing temperature of 1550 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 minutes and air cooled, followed by 1400 degrees for 30 minutes and cooling at 600 degrees per hour. In the future tests, I will label these as KSN or knife steel nerds because it uses the method that I lay out for normalizing and annealing. This process resulted in a fine spheroidized structure as expected. I also wanted to compare with New Jersey Steel Baron recommendations, so I took the same steel previously that was heated to 2000 degrees and used the recommended descending method of 10 minutes at 1650 in air cool, 1500 for 10 minutes in air cool, and then 1350 for 10 minutes in air cool. This resulted in a structure of mostly perlite. Comparing the hardness of these different conditions can provide some information on which are easiest to grind, drill, bandsaw cut, etc. The perlite structure resulting from the New Jersey Steel Baron recommendation is the highest in hardness at about 19 Rockwell C. Next were the Jantz and Alpha Knife Supply material at 15 to 16 Rockwell. Surprisingly, the anneal that I used resulted in a somewhat softer 13 RC. I'm not sure what gave it slightly lower hardness, but the combination of fine carbides and low annealed hardness is a very good result, of course. The Buderis material with the coarsest structure was also the softest at only 8 RC. How coarse the structure is also controls how it will respond to heat treatment. The bigger the distance between carbide, the slower the carbide dissolves. More dissolved carbide means higher hardness. Of these structures, the perlite has the smallest distance between carbide, followed by the fine spheroidized structure, and finally the coarse carbide dissolves the slowest. The potential disadvantage of the perlite structure is that it doesn't have the same possibility of controlling the carbide content and carbon in solution. For example, this chart of austenitizing 52100 shows that with the perlite structure, the hardness is at its maximum for a wide range of temperatures. But from a spheroidized condition, you can control the as-quenched hardness with temperature. This is especially useful in a high carbon steel like 52100 to avoid plate martensite, but is not as significant in ADCRV2 with its lower carbon content. This effect of prior microstructure on the as quenched hardness can be seen in this chart. The Buderis material had the coarsest carbides and therefore the lowest as quenched hardness. The AKS material resulted in slightly higher hardness due to its finer starting structure. The New Jersey Steel Baron structure of mostly perlite resulted in very high hardness despite the reduced temperature of 1475 recommended by their data sheet. This is from the rapid dissolution of the fine perlite microstructure. The Jantz, Alpha Knife Supply, and Knife Steel Nerds materials were in between corresponding with the fine carbide structures. To ensure that this was purely an effect of microstructure rather than composition, I also processed the Buderis material to have the same Knife Steel Nerds prior microstructure, and when I did that, I got the same hardness as the Knife Steel Nerds process chance material. This sensitivity to prior microstructure is the primary difference between 1084 and ADCRV2. The half percent of chromium in ADCRV2 is enough to make a difference in how the steel heat treats. When I heat treated Buderis 1084 with its coarser microstructure, I still got 66 RC as quenched as opposed to the 62 RC I got with the ADCRV2. The reason is because chromium is found preferentially in the carbide, so that element needs to diffuse for the carbides to dissolve. With 1084, it is only limited by carbon diffusion, which is a much smaller element that moves much faster at temperature. This chart shows simulations of carbide dissolution with time for ADCRV2. A fine spheroidized structure dissolves carbide significantly faster than coarse spheroidized, but 1080, even with a coarse starting structure, is much more rapid. This is primarily an issue with forage heat treating, where controlled hold time is challenging. However, if you have a perlite starting structure with ADCRV2, it acts much more similarly to 1080 steel, which is why I recommend a perlite starting structure for forge heat treating, but a fine spheroidized structure for furnace heat treating. But this difference in austenitizing behavior is an important distinction between ADCRV2 and the simpler steels 1075, 1080, and 1084, so this is something to keep in mind when heat treating the steel.
Next, I tested the toughness of the resulting steel after austenitizing, quenching, and tempering at 400 degrees Fahrenheit. I used a standard 1525 degrees for the KSN and Buderis material. For the Alpha Knife Supply material, that was heat treated by knife maker Warren Kryko, who also used 1525 degrees. For the steel I used for the New Jersey Steel Baron data sheet recommendations, they suggest 1475, so I used that. Presumably, they recommend a lower temperature to help compensate for the perlite starting structure. Another test I wanted to check is the higher austenitizing temperature recommended by B-Star, where they give a suggested range of 1545 to 1615. Austenitizing too high sometimes leads to a drop in toughness. For example, in experiments with 5160, we saw a drop with austenitizing as low as 1550, which makes me concerned about this suggested range of 1545 to 1615. So I heat treated some Jantz material using 1580 to see if this is too high, or if the vanadium addition helps keep the grain size in check. So to get right to it, the toughness was quite similar for most of the conditions. There wasn't too much carbon in solution or grain growth in the New Jersey Steel Baron recommended heat treatment or the Jantz material heated to the relatively hot 1580. This shows how insensitive ADCRV2 is to overheating with its combination of 0.8% carbon for minimal plate martensite and the vanadium for grain size control. The Buderis ADCRV2 with its coarser starting microstructure had somewhat lower hardness than the others. That also means that it had the most carbide after heat treating, however, which would give it a small increase in wear resistance. The Alpha Knife Supply, Jantz, and Knife Steel Nerds conditions also have some amount of carbide corresponding with how fine the microstructures were to begin with. The steel that was heat treated using New Jersey Steel Baron recommendations has almost no carbide left after heat treating, so its wear resistance is reduced. This is because of the perlite starting structure going into austenitizing, which rapidly dissolves. I also compared the toughness between using two different oils. For the conditions that I heat treated, each was quenched in Parks AAA at 120 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. The New Jersey Steel Baron data sheet says that a medium oil should be used with ADCRV2 and that if fast oil is used, it may result in reduced toughness. However, the Alpha Knife Supply coupons that Warren heat treated were quenched in DuraTherm 48, which is a fast oil equivalent to Parks 50, and the toughness was not reduced relative to the coupons quenched in AAA. The main reason to use medium or slower oils is to reduce the chance of warping rather than concerns with toughness. In my previous study on various quenching oils, I tested quarter inch thick ADCRV2 as one of the comparisons. This was Budera steel that was heat treated as supplied at 1525 for 18 minutes. The soak time is longer than a typical 10 to 15 minutes because of the greater thickness of the material. The hardness was about 62 Rockwell C with a fast quench because of the relatively coarse structure of the Buderis material. There were some inconsistent readings with the slow quench all and canola oils, and I couldn't tell if the hardness was actually reduced from insufficient cooling rate or if this was some kind of artifact. I also got some questions after reporting the results if the microstructure of the Buderis material would negatively affect the hardenability of the material. In fact, a coarse structure usually means increased hardenability. An array of fine carbides means there are more sites for perlite to start forming during cooling, meaning that a faster cooling rate may be required for full martensite formation and max hardness. If the hardness is reduced relative to a fast quench, that means you have formed some perlite. This isn't only bad because hardness is reduced, but perlite is both a soft structure in the steel on a microscopic scale and also reduces toughness. So we want to make sure we are quenching fast to avoid perlite formation. So I cycled the ADCRV2 to give it a fine spheroidized carbide structure using the same knife steel nerds recommendations as before. I then did the same 1525 austenitize for 18 minutes and quenched in quench all, which had resulted in only 60 RC with the as received material. But after the processing to give it a fine spheroidized structure, the steel was 66 Rockwell C and it maintained that hardness through the entire quarter inch thick cross section. So this is a pretty good result overall. Uh, it's very satisfying to perform heat treatments to improve steel behavior and it works out as intended. It's like taking a sad oil covered duck and cleaning it with Dawn dish soap. Look how happy he is now. I next tested some ADCRV2 that I cycled to have a perlite structure to see if that affected things. And I reduced the austenitizing temperature to 1475 to match the New Jersey Steel Baron recommendation. The hardness was 65 RC with Parks 50 but was reduced to only 62 RC with the quench all. Another factor that can reduce hardenability is using a lower than normal austenitizing temperature. This can be an issue when heat treating in a forge or other uncontrolled method. So I reduced the austenitizing temperature and held for only 10 minutes. With the time required to heat the quarter inch material, it probably spent very little time at 1450. In this case with Parks 50, the hardness was only 61 RC, 
probably due to reduced carbon in solution, though it's possible that hardenability was reduced enough to contribute to lower hardness. But quenching and quench all showed a definite reduction in hardenability where it only reached 55 Rockwell near the surface and 52 at the center. So with a spheroidized starting structure and a good osinatize, ADCRV2 can be quenched with a wide range of oils, even with quarter inch thick stock. But with perlite and under osinatizing, a fast oil is necessary unless the stock is thinner than quarter inch or bevels are partially ground prior to osinatizing and quenching. We also measured hardness and toughness for the Alpha Knife Supply heat-treated coupons with a range of tempering temperatures. Using a temperature of 300 degrees Fahrenheit resulted in 63.5 RC, which is a relatively high hardness. The hardness is reduced by about one Rockwell per 50 degrees above 300. The toughness is also increased by tempering at increased temperatures until 450. When tempering at 500 or 550, the toughness was reduced by a phenomenon called tempered martensite embrittlement. When the martensite is tempered, carbon is allowed out of solution by precipitating out as small carbides. These carbides get larger with increasing temperature until a point is reached where larger carbide plates form that are detrimental to toughness. So even though the hardness was reduced by tempering higher, the toughness is also lower, so the properties are overall worse. So the acceptable tempering range is between 300 and 450 degrees. That gives a range of hardness from 60 to 63.5 RC, which should provide an adequate selection of properties. Okay, so we went through a lot of different tests and combinations to arrive at the final recommendations. So I'm gonna summarize the recommended heat treatments for different situations. First, forge steel with a furnace to heat treat with. Normalize at 1550 to 1650 degrees for at least 10 minutes followed by air cooling. Anneal by heating to 1400 degrees for 30 minutes followed by slow cooling at 600 degrees per hour. Osinatize at 1525 for 10 to 15 minutes for eighth inch thick material followed by quenching in a fast or medium oil. Temper at 300 to 450 degrees twice. Next, heat treating with a forge to heat treat with, stock removal or forging. Normalize by heating to 1600 degrees, check temperature with a temple stick or laser thermometer. Heat to non-magnetic and no hotter and quench in a fast oil. Temper at 300 to 450 degrees twice. This is the method that I developed for heat treating without temperature control. This allowed me to heat treat seven different steels in a forge with no prior experience and all of them had good hardness and toughness, including ADCRV2. You can watch the video about my forge heat treating to learn more. Forge heat treating is not something I recommend in general because furnace heat treating provides much more consistent results and you can dial in the heat treatment parameters to have optimal performance. I am an engineer and I love my furnace and the consistent results it gives me. And I can't imagine heat treating a product I would be selling with a forge heat treatment. But I know people are still going to heat treat with a forge so you might as well do it with a method that is more likely to work. And using a perlite starting structure allows you to heat to non-magnetic without guessing about how much hotter to go which makes things much more consistent. You can add an optional grain refining step in between the normalize and the final osinatize and quench. This is done by heating to non-magnetic and no hotter and air cooling. The more grain refining steps you add, the more spheroidized the structure will be, and the more it will act like annealed steel, making the final osinatize more challenging. So if you add this step, just do it once. When doing furnace heat treating, the grain refining step isn't necessary because the anneal also acts to refine the grain size. Okay, next, stock removal using as supplied material with furnace heat treating. Osinatize at 1525 for 10 to 15 minutes for eighth inch thick material followed by quenching in a fast or medium oil. Temper at 300 to 450 degrees twice. All right, uh, hopefully you learned a thing or two about ADC RV2 and hopefully I managed to make this boring steel interesting. All of the different heat treating tests were fun actually. Uh, we were able to illustrate a lot of different aspects of heat treating low alloy steels and the micrographs helped to show what was going on as well. With all the different conditions that the steel can be in and all of the different heat treatment recommendations out there, this steel can look a lot more complicated than it is. If you follow the basic steps of normalize, anneal, osinatize, quench, and temper using the temperatures I recommend, it will turn out great. I promise. Or you can keep heat treating in a forge and rolling the dice. It's up to you. Stock removal is even easier because we can skip the normalize and anneal steps. So happy heat treating. Bye everybody. Thank you to all our new Patreon supporters. Patreon is a service that allows us to pay for all of these experiments that we do. The video is free, but all of these experiments are not. So thank you to everyone who comes and supports us on patreon.com slash knifesteelnerds. We use that money for all these experiments and for the outside experiments that we're doing and for the video and video editing. It all costs money and Patreon pays for all of that. So thank you to everyone who supports us and thank you to anyone who's considering supporting Knifesteelnerds through Patreon.